Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Schumacast, a podcast exploring the filmography of Joel Schumacher. I am Noel, being joined, as always, by Angie. Hey, everybody. And we are being joined by a very special guest today. Everyone, please welcome Weston. Hi there. Welcome. Thank you. You've been one of my friends ever since, you know, the formation of the initial Made of Fail circle. Yeah. And we've collaborated on a few things together. I know you've guessed on a few shows, but our big things are we were both co-writers on the blogs, Deconstructing Moya, where we went through all of Farscape and... Crap, what did we call the My Little Pony one? Deconstruction is Magic? Uh, yep, that was it. Yes, Deconstruction is Magic, where we went through My Little Pony. Absolutely. This is Farscape's 20th anniversary of this year. It's, oh, it's so good. We need to rewatch that again. I know, and I never got around to the comics. I still have them all, and I never read um, <laughs> After the miniseries, I don't know. Anything else you want to plug or anything? Um, nah, I got nothing. How's your hair been lately? My hair is much shorter than <laughs> mm. you probably remember. Yeah, I know. It's I try to keep it around an inch and a half or so, yeah, you know, yeah. way shorter than the 15 inches when I was donating it to yeah. charity. But it's so much easier to keep and uh, the tiny grabby hands can't get into it anymore. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, How's the beard? Oh, the beard lives. It's much whiter than you remember. Ooh, the ooh. salt has overtaken the pepper. <laughs> so you've gone white and I've gone bald. We've gotten old. <laughs> Trying to think. Yeah, we've known each other for about a decade now. Roughly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Wow>. Memory. <laughs> Time passes. Yeah. This being a Joel Schumacher film, we are here to discuss The Client, which came out in 1994. What's your, your history with the films of Joel Schumacher and your overall impressions of him as a director? My direct experience with Joel Schumacher films is somewhat limited. I'm actually not super familiar with his filmography. Mm. I know that he has done some really fantastic films, also some that were less fantastic. <laughs> but overall, he's a director. He makes pretty decent movies, by and large. Mm -hmm. You know, he's got a very famous name. Yes, <laughs> yes. He's the one that put nipples in 8mm. <laughs> Wait. No, exactly. <laughs> Nice. Wait, no. All right, The Client, is this a film either of you had ever seen before? I do not believe I have. I purposely didn't go looking up the details before I watched mm -hmm. it because there were so many of these court drama films around this time. So I'm like, is this the one with Julia Roberts? Is it the one with the kid? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I had never actually seen this one before. There wasn't ringing any bells when I mm. watched it this time. I saw this movie many years ago. I can't remember exactly when I first saw it. I remembered the basic details. Couldn't remember the late middle or the ending. Like, I remembered that they wound up in a boathouse. I didn't remember how or why. Why did the lawyer and the kid go to the boathouse? That makes no sense. Couldn't possibly happen. <laughs> oh, we'll have things to say about that, yes. Yeah. It turns out, no, that's just the novel being the novel. <laughs> did read the novel something like 20 years ago. Oh. I remember that some things were in the novel that weren't in the novel movie. Mm -hmm. Can't remember exactly what those were, but I remember it ended a little different. Well, seeing as I just read the novel. Nice. And the screenplay, <laughs> right? I can add a few things to that. Yes. Oh, boy. Well, I have things to say about that. <laughs> yeah. My first time reading an Akiva Goldsman screenplay. I say, one of your mm. favorite screenwriters. It was everything I thought it would be. <laughs> Good. This was the first Joel Schumacher film I ever saw in a theater. Because I cool. would have been 12 when this came out. And I know my dad was already a fan of the John Grisham novels. Mm -hmm. To this day, John Grisham was one of his favorite writers. So we went and saw this film. I think we'd actually seen The Bellican Brief, which came out before this. Okay. And we saw this film in theaters. I still remember enjoying it back then. We'll talk about what I think of it now. But I remember having very fond memories, even though I don't believe I'd ever seen it again since. <laughs> so that would have been 25 years ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> 
All right, let's get into a little production history. After spending a decade practicing criminal law and a six-year stint in the Mississippi House of Representatives, John Grisham debuted as an author in 1989 with A Time to Kill, and what followed was a decade of best-selling novels including The Firm, The Pelican Brief, The Chamber, The Rainmaker, and The Runaway Jury, all of which were adapted for film beginning with The Pelican Brief in 1993. The Client was his fourth novel and the third adapted to screen. While the film adaptations have wound down a bit, he's since continued as a successful author, still primarily focusing on legal thrillers, but occasionally writing country dramas, sports stories, or the occasional screwball comedy like Skipping Christmas, which was filmed as Christmas with the Cranks. <laughs> really? No, Weston, you'd said you read the novel 20 years ago. Have you ever read much else by Grisham? Yeah, a few of his books. Not terribly many. I think I have a couple on the bookshelf. I would need to double check. But some of those legal thrillers, they're legal and they're thrillers. And they kind of blur together after a certain <laughs> point. Yeah. No offense to legal thrillers. They are thrilling. Mm -hmm. They're also legal. And that balance of uppers <laughs> and downers is unique in that I can't quite separate them. <laughs> Angie, have you ever read any of this book before? Did he do The Firm, too? Yep. Mm -hmm. I think I read that one, but I mean, we're talking about whenever it came out, yeah. so very little memories. Yeah, and funnily enough, the only novel of his I ever read was Skipping Christmas, which was filmed as Christmas with the Cranks. <laughs> and I've still never seen Christmas with the Cranks. <laughs> Probably for the best. Yeah. I did see most of the film adaptations of the 90s. Like, I've seen mm -hmm. Pelican Brief, I saw this, I saw The Chamber, Runaway Jury. Funnily enough, I've never seen The Firm, and I've never seen A Time to Kill, which we're going to be getting to in a few months, because that's also Joel Schumacher. Mm -hmm. And then the primary screenwriter on the film Sorry, was yeah. Akiva Goldsman, a prolific, successful writer, producer, yep. and a blight on the film industry as we know it. <laughs> One of these things is an opinion, but it's not necessarily a wrong opinion. Yes. The Client <laughs> was his first produced screenplay, coming out just four months before his actual first and to date only original screenplay, Silent Fall, about a psychiatrist who has to get a nonverbal autistic boy to speak about a murder he witnessed. Uh-huh. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. As written by Akiva Goldsman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I tried to get a copy of this film. It is, like, not available anywhere. <laughs> I was also curious to read it. Akiva Goldsman's only original screenplay. I had to read it. I couldn't find it. Of course, yeah. Man, that's unfortunate. <laughs> so this film began a partnership between him and Joel Schumacher, which would continue for Batman Forever, A Time to Kill, and infamously Batman and Robin. Mm. Oh, dear. Despite this, his power continued to rise afterwards as he became a regular <laughs> writer for Ron Howard with the Dan Brown adaptation Cinderella Man and a beautiful mind for which he somehow won the Academy Award. Really? I bet he's quick. I bet he works really fast. <laughs> I think he's one of those ones who just does whatever the producer directors say. Oh, you want that, that in there? Yeah. Okay, here you go. That makes sense. Yeah. You know, it's definitely a way to turn out scripts that are exactly what the client yeah. is looking for. And by golly, the client, yep. sure, they can be right, I guess. I don't hate all of his movies that he's worked on. Let me put it that way. Okay. Well, getting to that, he then also became a writer and producer on a lot of films that I want to like a lot more than I do, mostly because of the way he wrote them. <laughs> films like Lost in Space, <laughs> iRobot, Constantine, mm -hmm. I Am Legend, mm -hmm. Hancock, mm -hmm. Jonah Hex, mm -hmm. the most recent Guy Ritchie King Arthur movie. <laughs> but I'm I don't even remember that. And Dark Tower. <sighs> That should have been so good. At some point, he also took over the Ring, Paranormal Activity, and Divergent franchises. Seriously? Yep. Man. And he produced Paranormal Activity from two onward. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And then also with television shows like Fringe, Star Trek Discovery, and Titans, because after Batman and Robin, they brought him back to create Titans, <laughs> he's also shifted into being a director, leading to his feature debut with Winter's Tale. Oh, okay. So Akiva Goldsman. In fairness, I really did like Lost in Space. I like everything except the way it's written. <laughs> 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 the dialogue in that movie is atrocious. <laughs> no, I love the production design. The cast is mostly okay. It's actually it's a fun story. Hey, here's the thing about Kiva Goldsman. He's not an incapable screenwriter. No. I think he is one of those screenwriters who has the barest level of basic competency. <laughs> But the problem is, is that his dialogue is really clunky and hackneyed. He falls on a lot of tropes. Like, you know, that scene mm -hmm. in movies, like I think Independence Day was the only one I kind of liked it in. But, you know, that scene in a lot of movies where someone is dejected because they can't solve a mystery. And then someone else just talks about some random shit. And then that somehow sparks <laughs> a light bulb in them. And they go, you're a genius. Thanks. And the other person is like, yeah. perplexed. What did I do? Yeah. He's done that in five different movies. 
Oh. He falls on a lot of tropes. And I'll even say, mm. the screenplay that I read for this had scenes that weren't in the novel that he wrote original that thankfully were all cut from the finished film, okay. including a bit where Reggie stands up and gives a speech before the AA where she talks about how hard it is to fight to go the distance. And she literally says, it's so hard to fight to go the distance. <laughs> And it's just the corniest yeah. writing. And I remember watching the pilot episode of Star Trek Discovery, and I knew Brian Fuller started working on that series and he had left somewhere. Mm -hmm. And the very opening sequence of the episode, I'm like, beautiful photography, this cast looks good. Ooh, ooh, there's something wrong with this dialogue. There's something wrong with this dialogue. <laughs> and I remember thinking, wait, something about this dialogue feels familiar. <laughs> Oh, no. And then the credit <laughs> sequence played and it says, written by Brian Fuller and Akiva Goldsman. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. He just keeps getting attached to things that I really want to like, but then he insists on always doing the final draft. You know, I'm wondering, because my main opinion of him, he can't adapt things, or at least he's not trying to adapt things other than grabbing characters most of the time. I, Robot, and I Am Legend. Those are two movies that I really like. They're terrible adaptations. Absolutely terrible as an adaptation. Yeah. But I think they make good movies. And the thing with I Am Legend is it's literally a dude by himself most of the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to have a whole lot of dialogue, really. No, I know. Idiot. But it's like he literally erased the entire point of the title. I yeah. agree. By throwing out the like entire said, second half of the book. Terrible yeah. adaptation. Mm-hmm. Both of those movies, I made the terrible mistake of reading the book before going to yeah. see it. And I was yeah. just like, this is nothing like that. Right, right. I mean, I robot, I just don't like his dialogue and writing. It, it, on its mm -hmm. own, separated from the book that it's not even based on. Mm -hmm. right. Also, it's a good story. It's well directed. I love all mm -hmm. the robot effects. The plot takes mm -hmm. some good twists and turns. And a lot of that is Jeff Fintar, the original writer, and then Leda Calagritis, who wrote the recent Battle Angel adaptation, too. Mm -hmm. She did a lot of work on that script and Akiva did the final draft because every film that he produces, he insists on doing mm. the final draft. Okay. Yeah. And Constantine is an incredibly well-directed movie and the plot is fine. And I like the cast for the most part. It's just the dialogue is mm -hmm. terrible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Akiva Goldsman, I'm not a fan. Yeah. I'm not even going to start on Dark Tower. But... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tune into the new podcast, Akiva Goldsman cast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I toyed with that idea for a while, but then it would just be me hate ranting. You just don't want to be that negative all the time. Yeah. yeah. See, what can I find to enjoy about them? I love that about you, that you can find things to enjoy <laughs> in things that are otherwise difficult. As I said, Akiva Goldsman is barely competent. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> mm -mm -mm. And again, we'll have more things to say. I mean, I know yeah. with the client at a time to kill, it helps that they're adaptations. I know Batman Forever did already have a pretty solid draft before he came aboard. But Batman and Robin, that's him. Oh, boy. He was the only writer involved on that one from beginning to end. Okay. But anyways, as I said, I read the screenplay. Again, 80% of it is just straight from the novel. Anything that he added is just really corny and hokey. And the majority of that was someone did another pass on the script before we got to the finished film. Because a lot of his dialogue was rewritten. And most of these scenes that he added are not here. Good. And you can read some of those scenes on my Twitter feed. <laughs> <laughs> Then the only other note I have is that the other screenwriter involved in this, Robert Getchell, I don't know if he worked before. I don't know if he's the one who did the final polish. Usually you don't get a credit if you're just doing a polish. And mostly it was just mm -hmm. cleaning up the dialogue and stuff. This was his final film after a career going back to the 70s, which gave us Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, Bound for Glory, and Mommy Dearest. Okay. This isn't what I expected from a collaboration between Joel Schumacher and the writer of Mommy Dearest. No. Though to be fair, <laughs> imagine Joel Schumacher's Mommy Dearest. Nope. Yes. <laughs> no. No. Can't make me. Starring <laughs> Kiefer Sutherland as Joan Crawford. <laughs> Jeez. Yes. Goodness. Mm -mm -mm. Ooh, ooh. Tommy Lee Jones as Joan Crawford. That would be. Okay, now you're that, sitting me on that. that. Ooh. There we go. Ooh, he's got the brass. Mm. <laughs> no wire hangers. <laughs> okay, so let's um, bring him back on track. Angie, do you want to give us the synopsis for The Client? Sure. Mark Sway, a young poor boy in Memphis, steals a couple cigarettes from his mother's purse and leads his younger brother out into the woods to teach him how to smoke. While there, they witness a man trying to commit suicide by attaching a hose to the exhaust pipe of his car. 
Mark tries to save the man's life, but only angers him instead. The man is Jerome Romy Clifford, a New Orleans lawyer who figures he's as good as dead anyway because his mob client has told him where the body of a murdered man is buried. He tells Mark where the body is, too, after dragging him into the car to die along with him. However, Clifford doesn't realize Mark's brother is still outside the car, and when it's his turn to remove the pipe, Clifford shoots himself in the head instead. Mark calls 911 and claims that he and his brother only stumbled upon Clifford's dead body, but this super jerk of a policeman isn't buying it. Mark's brother is suffering from severe PTSD and isn't talking, but the policeman keeps trying to scare the truth out of Mark. After witnessing a lawyer elsewhere in the hospital, Mark decides he needs one too. He stumbles into the office of Reggie Love, and while he's initially very tight-lipped about what happened, she agrees to defend him anyway. The FBI of New Orleans and Memphis show up trying to question Mark, along with a high-powered DA from New Orleans nicknamed Reverend Roy because he loves to quote scripture. The mob also sends up their goons to try to find out what Mark knows. Reggie finds herself needing to protect Mark from both of them while simultaneously trying to find out what he actually knows herself. In the midst of an argument, Reverend Roy reveals that he knows that Reggie used to be an alcoholic and drug addict, and Mark is initially angered and wants to fire her because his own father was the same. However, once she opens up to him about how and why it happened, and how much she misses her own children who no longer want anything to do with her, Mark softens. He finally admits to her everything that happened, and Reggie does her best to protect him. She knows that the moment he gives away the location of the body, he and his family are in danger, so she works to get them into witness protection. The trailer Mark and his family live in is burned down, and his brother is still in shock, so they literally have nothing. Mark takes it upon himself to verify where the body is first, fearing that the information Clifford gave him was wrong, the FBI won't actually help his family. So he convinces Reggie to drive him all the way down to New Orleans so they can find the body. While searching for it in Clifford's boathouse, the mob also appear trying to move the body, and the two of them make a narrow escape, tripping a neighbor's alarm system in order to get away. Reggie makes a deal with Roy to grant the family a new start under witness protection, and only once they are on a plane to safety will she reveal where the body is. Mark has a tearful goodbye with Reggie, and she gives him a compass she always wears around her neck, saying it will now keep him going in the right direction like it did for her. Roy gets his big win in the mob case and a chance of being governor of Louisiana, while Reggie literally walks off into the sunset with her assistant. So Angie, do you recommend the client? No, it's not like a really strong, like, oh God, stay away. It just didn't really have anything that pulled me in and made me want to recommend it to anybody. As we were talking about, there are some dialogue issues, I think, for sure, in some of his writing. I don't know. It was like, okay, so the kid doesn't want to talk and then they wanted him to talk. And it was just like, could we just get on with it, please? <laughs> like, it just kind of kept spinning its wheels for a while. It didn't feel very thrilling to me personally. Weston, do you recommend the client? It's okay. I would not go out of my way to say, oh man, you totally got to see this film. It's not exactly something that I would throw in the junk pile either. It's like if I saw it on Netflix and I had other choices, I would probably go with those other choices. For me, one of the big things was the amount of straight up misogyny throughout the film. It was mm. just like constant like yeah. humidity. It's everywhere. It's overbearing. Why is everyone like this? Oh, sure. It's the American South. <laughs> but no. What do you mean Reggie Love is a lady lawyer? What? No, let me talk to your boss, Mr. Love. I would not recommend this film. It's kind of pretty in some points, but not really. Mm. I recommend it. What? <laughs> I think one of the biggest misconceptions when I read the novel is it's not a thriller. It's a character piece. Mm -hmm. They tried to make the movie a little more of a thriller by adding in a few extra yeah. scenes. But it's a character piece. And the book was also just supposed to be an exploration of how do you force a kid to testify? Mm -hmm. What are the actual legal precedences of that? While yeah. also just making it a character piece about these clash between attorneys, the kid, all the various people around them, the mob, the press. It was kind of this ensemble piece all centered around this one concept of a kid witnesses a crime and doesn't want to talk about it. Yeah. The film doesn't quite capture that. It's trying to make it a little bit more straightforward of a drama, adding a little bit of a thriller element to it. But I think it's well made. I think the cast is good. I think a lot of the scenes play out strong. It is a little too loose of a plot. Mm -hmm. I don't like where the third act goes. I think the third act is a little mm -hmm. overly silly. Yeah. But to be fair, I didn't like that in the novel either. Mm -hmm. They didn't fix it. <laughs> it was a problem in the novel, <laughs> right. and they didn't quite fix it. Yeah. yeah. But I still, I enjoy it. It was neat seeing a film like this when I was the same age as the kid. Mm -hmm. So it was neat seeing an adult contemporary legal drama with thriller elements through the point of view of a kid. 
I almost did. Yeah, the script is a little clunky here and there. It's better than it was under Akiva, which is <laughs> why I'm still like surprised that he then went on to do three more films with this director. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I still think it comes together well enough that I enjoy it. I love the cast. I love a lot of their interactions. Susan Sarandon, Tommy Jones, amazing. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, I do find it a nice movie. It's not a great movie. It's not a fantastic movie. It's a nice movie. I don't know that I would go see it in a theater now, yeah. but like you said, I would watch it on TV. Mm-hmm. So kind of moving into some open discussion, why don't we just start with Mark, played by Brad Renfro, in his first movie. I feel like and maybe I haven't had a chance to say it on here yet, since this is his first movie ever. I've always loved Brad Renfro. He's another one of those very tragic, yeah. obviously went into Hollywood at the wrong time, fell in with the wrong crowd, never got out of it kind of thing. Well, he fell in with Brian Singer, unfortunately. Yeah, I know. That's, yeah, I was thinking yeah. about that yeah. the other day. Some of the accusations against Brian Singer directly place him with a lot of those parties. Mm, oh. Okay. But I can understand why they chose him for this. He feels very, very genuine. He's carrying a lot of weight in this movie. And a lot of other kids, especially for this time period, I don't think could have handled it as Mm -hmm. well as he does here. You know, I mean, he's not giving you an amazing performance. But like I said, he feels like a real kid. He doesn't feel like someone just reciting lines or anything like that. Yeah, he does do a really good job of selling the character. The parts where, you know, he's cursing and he's threatening violence and, you know, he's smoking and all of that. This is a very 90s film. Yeah. yeah. Him and his lawyer sharing a cigarette. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The moments where he turns off that over the top, haha, I'm a macho teenager stuff and it's just kind of vulnerable. I mean, yeah, I think that he sells both of those really well. Yeah. And it's interesting the authenticity he brings because I know the studio wanted Macaulay Culkin. Mm. What? And both John Grisham and Joel Schumacher were like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that would be a different movie. That would be a very different movie. And I don't know how much the backstory you know about this, but Brad Renfro comes out of a home of addiction. Both his parents had addiction yeah. issues. He was spending a lot of time with his grandmother because of that. And mm-hmm. he himself already had alcohol issues where he would oh. keep stealing beer and alcohol when he was like nine and 10. And mm-hmm. it was through a juvenile treatment program and delinquency program that he was actually cast for this movie. Mm-hmm. There was an acting program tied to this where it was like, let's teach kids how to act and try to find ways to get them to confront issues that they're dealing with. And so he already mm-hmm. came to Hollywood with problems. Mm-hmm. Sure. And Joel became very close to the family, helped them get a new home. For years, he kept trying to help Brad Renfro with drug treatment, mm-hmm. even as Brad Renfro went in and out. And even on set, Brad Renfro was like stealing beers and cigarettes. And Joel <laughs> had to actually get handlers just to follow him around and keep him from doing it. Yeah. Susan Sarandon even talked about the day when Brad died and Joel took it upon himself to call up every member of the the client cast and crew to talk to him about it. Wow. He's a very authentic kid who had a lot of authentic problems, and I think the industry made it worse. Yeah. Yeah. But even kind of just setting that aside, I like his performance. He's obviously not a professionally honed actor. I mean, he's an 11-year-old kid who's never been in a movie before. Mm -hmm. But he feels very genuine. He feels very natural. He's got a good charisma, a good energy. A lot of the scenes have a lot of great little moments in them. Mm -hmm. He was 11? Yeah. Wow, all right. Yep. He was 10 when he was in the juvenile program for being an alcoholic. Yeah. Yeah. Poor thing. Yeah. I like little moments, like even appalling as it is that an older brother's teaching his little brother how to smoke, you know, it feels like a very natural scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like the whole discussion of like, just smoke one a day and then you won't get sick for a really long time. Well, how much mm-hmm. does mom smoke? Silly. About 30 a day. Is she going to be okay? <laughs> how much does dad smoke? About 100 a day. Oh, good. That'll kill him soon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, Angie, especially just curious to you, what what do you think about the Southern setting? Oh. (laughs) How many Elvises were in this movie? The Confederate license plate on that car. I mean, if you really want me to get... Like, okay, Tommy Lee Jones sounds like he's maybe from Georgia. He definitely does not sound like Louisiana Mm. at all. I love the way they're like, let's just drive down to New Orleans. Like, that's a six hour drive. (laughs) It is not close by. I guarantee you that Clifford House was not in the state of Louisiana, or if it was, it was nowhere near the city of New Orleans. <laughs> we have these things called levees. Yeah. You can't just put a boathouse. <laughs> We're below sea level, folks. You can't just do that. Yeah. So I do think they might have filmed on Bourbon Street. Yeah, just that one scene. Yeah. And there was a moment of the skyline. Yeah, the intro for Barry. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, there was a lot of the accents and the... Mm, no. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, especially Anthony Lapaglia as Barry the Blade. Yeah, yeah, he was ridiculous. He was Australian and was trying to do New Orleans. <laughs> Oh, that explains so much. I mean, he was a goofy character to begin with. Yeah. No, looking it up, yeah, they did just film a couple of bits in New Orleans, but okay. most of it was filmed in Tennessee and Mississippi, which to be okay. fair, most of the story is set in Tennessee okay. and Mississippi, but yeah. Right. Yeah. Tennessee is fun. And I can't speak entirely to Memphis. I love how they had to have Elvis like, all over the place. He was <laughs> everywhere. It's the Elvis Presley Memorial Wing. Wow. <laughs> The Elvis impersonator yeah. in the hospital. Yeah, uh-huh. how many Elvis sightings were there in this movie? Maybe you forgot we're in Memphis. Let me remind <laughs> you. Here's the thing. The Elvis Pesley Pez dispenser <laughs> that was, good. was not a real thing. That was a production design thing they had to make for this movie. Oh, wow. Really? I'm sure they have to have them by now. Oh, yeah. But I could picture Joel Schumacher <laughs> being like, oh, we have to do this. <laughs> Let's go into, we got the main central conflict between Susan Sarandon and Tommy Lee Jones. Mm-hmm. Wes, what did you think about Susan Sarandon as Reggie Love? Magnificent. Best performance in the movie. Easily. I agree. No, Reggie was fantastic. Introduction, you know, fixing her own windows through displaying her professionalism, her knowledge of her field. When she's ambushed by Roy, each time something comes up, she manages to deflect it in a way that successfully resolves it in their favor. It feels a little bit contrived with the Fifth Amendment thing in the courtroom, but, you know, that's Mm. writing. But she sells it. Her face acting, vocal emotion, you know, she brings it out. And I think it really works. Agreed. I think she's definitely the strongest actor in this film. For someone who is a recovering addict, who's lost her family, obviously cares very much about her job, she manages to bring all these different range of emotions that even if the writing isn't 100% there, she's still filling in the lines and making you really feel this character. I agree. I think her and Tommy Lee Jones, I know the marketing was built a lot around those two. Mm. I love every scene they're playing off each other, but that's very little of the movie. Most of it is just her and Brad Renfro. And mm-hmm. yeah, I like her performance. I like the strengths of how firmly she believes in the cause that she's fighting for, but also the frustrations with not only what she's lost, but this damn kid. Mm-hmm. This was part of my problem with both the novel and the movie is a lot of this movie is just contrived around Mark not saying anything mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and just trying to get Mark to say something. Yeah. Even in the book, I never fully bought that things would go this far without him just saying, yeah, he told me where the body is. Mm-hmm. Right. Even before he was actually threatened by the mob, there's so much stonewalling there. Mostly just for ploppers. But he's mm-hmm. a stupid kid, you know, being a stupid kid. That's <laughs> what kids do, right? <laughs> Even just bits where he learns that she was an alcoholic, you mm-hmm. know, and just explodes mm-hmm. at her. And they try to justify it because he associates that with his dad who was an alcoholic. Right, right. I do like that scene between them where she's like, just fine, ask me anything you want, I'll tell you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's like story-wise, I don't think this story ever comes together fully, both book or movie. But again, it's like I like mm-hmm. a lot of the individual scenes and how a lot of the individual things play out. Yeah, yeah plot-wise, when Mark breaks out of jail, they don't have anybody watching him at the hospital. They leave him on the cart and they just walk away. Nobody's watching him. Oh, did you not hear the line about where's his police officer? Oh, he's just a juvenile. Ah, yeah. It's so ridiculous. But still, like, that's such a throwaway line for an easy escape. Yeah. Right, right. They had to get him out of there somehow. And he doesn't have hairpins, I guess. <laughs> That was something that I never really, but again, book and movie. Mm -hmm. Mark escalating his refusal to talk to the point where he literally escapes prison and (laughs) goes on this whole run to, hey, let's actually go dig up the body just to make sure it's there. (laughs) Yeah, like what? (laughs) Which also overlaps with the mob finally realizing, hey, if someone knows where the body is, maybe we should move the body. Oh, no, they couldn't move the body because the police were crawling all over the house. They couldn't, right? The investigation. They couldn't get in there because yeah. the police were investigating. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And then the whole bit where Kim Coates, the mobster, is chasing him through the hospital, that was entirely added for the movie. Okay. It's a well-executed sequence. How long were they in that stairwell? Yeah, but <laughs> the story just never fully comes together. Yeah. Yeah. Can I also just say that is like the dirtiest hospital I've ever seen? Holy smoke, yes. <laughs> Outside of Silent Hill, anyway. Yeah. Like- yeah. 
yeah, <laughs> it's a very close second there, like with the smoking in the hallways and the brown tile everywhere. Mm -hmm. This is a very early 90s movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's in that sequence where it's like, oh, by the way, remember this guy directed Flatliners. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like we're getting into the neon blue observation room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're getting into the morgue where the freezer is lit red. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Why not? As you do. Well, you know, red light bulbs are cheaper. Again, it's a snappy visual flair. I think that sequence mm -hmm. is well put together. It's just not interesting story-wise. And again, Mark's entire uh -huh. breakout leading to the third act culmination at the boathouse is just way too contrived story-wise. Reggie is an amazing shot. I know, right? Like her <laughs> marksmanship with a yeah. four-inch barrel shooting something like 120 feet away. Oh, man. Sure. <laughs> I buy it. In the book, it was a bit different where they never actually interact with the crooks. They're hiding in the bushes. They see the crooks digging in the boathouse and... Mm -hmm. Mark just picks up a rock and throws it through the neighbor's window. Hmm. Okay. That makes so much more sense. Yeah. Well, not really because it was still a terrible scene, but... <laughs> it makes more sense. But you have to have the big Hollywood moment where the villain and the hero confront one another because Kiva Goldsman believes in the tropes and the cliches. <laughs> but we had that throughout the movie every time that Reggie and Boy were facing off. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Bury the blade and the mobsters <laughs> should always be this looming threat. You don't need to actually have... Also, Barry is being followed by the FBI on a regular basis. Why is he going to the boathouse? Because he's really dumb. He does not in the book. He's so dumb. Because his uncle said he had to. Yeah. You gotta clean it up yourself. Hang on. Let me see if I can. <clears throat> you gotta clean it up yourself. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll never be able to trust you again. We'll never be able to use it for anything again. You gotta do this yourself. Oh, you're through. And then they get to the end, it's like, you're going upstate. Oh, boy. By which I mean, you're going to the farm. <laughs> oh, yeah. In Akiva Goldsman's script, he has, and his uncle gives him the kiss, the mobster's kiss, the kiss of death. Oh, of course. Seriously? <laughs> That's amazing. Why not? Whatever happened to the other guy that they hired to pursue the kid who was you know, Elvis Pesley guy? Well, he's a private detective, though, mm -hmm. so he's not going to do all the dirty work. He's a security specialist. Yeah. Yeah, in the movie, he's uh, Gronky. Kind of a name is Gronky. No, Gronky was the one Gronky's who chases the other him guy, through right? the uh, hospital. Well, yeah, but he hires Neds, saying, oh, you're the PI, and he says, I'm a security specialist, and he's a local muscle guy that they yeah. bring in. You know, mm. when you need child murders, he's the guy you go to. <laughs> when I know there was a plot thread that was cut, it was in the script, too, so it might have just been deleted footage where he was arrested by the FBI when they caught him bugging Reggie's office. Okay. Uh, okay. They set him up throughout the movie, and then he just disappears. Vanish. Mm -hmm. When was the last time we saw him? I mean, I think when they were at Reggie's house. The security guard during the court case, right? What do they call bailiffs? Maybe was he was that, a yeah. bailiff. Yeah. Yeah. When he yeah. was driving the bailiff for information. Yeah, I think that was it. And says bye bye. Yeah. That's his sunset movie. Threw his money in the in the toilet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just to be mean. <laughs> What I liked about the book was, again, it was a very ensemble. It just had this one hook. This kid witnesses a murder and he's afraid to testify. And it just mm -hmm. explored all these. There's, there was actually a good sense of humor to the book. There's kind of a playful wit to it. I think Grisham mm -hmm. is a very good, like, actual writer. His prose is very nice. Mm -hmm. And it was neat seeing who are all the peripheral people that would appear and float around this case. You have the hitman. You have the various branches of the FBI. You have the DA and his various crew. You have Reggie and her assistant. You have the family. You have... Of. Again, there was a whole plot thread involving the mother being fired and Reggie suing the company. Mm -hmm. $5 an hour. There was a lot more to just kind of exploring. If this happened, what are all these peripheral things that would fly off of it? Yeah, I thought it was neat, mm -hmm. like the number of characters that the main characters were addressing by first name. It's like, who are they on a first name basis with? Mm -hmm. You know, you got Roy, he's on a first name basis with his coterie, yeah. but also with the pilot of his private jet <laughs> and nobody else, I guess. But Reggie, you know, she's on a first name basis with the judge in the case, with the gal who's opening the door at jail. Even Doreen, yeah, the prison guard. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. She has an entire schloss yeah. in the book. Yeah. It was neat seeing, again, that actress. Yeah, Kimberly Scott. This is her fourth Joel Schumacher nice. thing. She's become a regular. Good. Mm -hmm. I looked her up. We still have more coming. Good. <laughs> okay. She's solid. <laughs> she is, but she always just gets these bit parts. I always wanted to see her have big parts. Yeah, I know. They're so yeah. small. Yeah. I mean, her Flatliners part was kind of nice, but she's always relegated to either bit parts or the mm -mm girlfriend, best friend in <laughs> 2000 mm -hmm. Malibu Road, who's in two scenes. Right. <laughs> yep.
I mean, even the book, though, it was really interesting how he painted this world and what are all the actual politics and legalities also. But then it just mm-hmm. kind of fizzled as it's like, well, now we have to figure out how to end this. And then, oh, Mark escapes from prison to go down to the boathouse and sure. shenanigans <laughs> ensue. Yeah. Right. That's great. Yeah. And the film, it's trying to streamline it. Because, I mean, the whole Fifth Amendment thing in the book, it mm-hmm. was like Mark just did that on his own and it opened up a whole can of worms in terms of what is the Fifth Amendment? Can he use it here? What are the legalities? of a child using it. Where does mm. it apply? Where does it apply? It's this whole can of words. And here is just, I plead the fifth and Susan Sarandon smiles with pride. Well, <laughs> in the book, she was like, oh crap, that's going to open a whole can of words. <laughs> yeah, probably a little too technical for the average audience goer. So. Oh, definitely. Hey, it was through this movie that as a 12 year old, I learned what plead the fifth is. <laughs> sure. Very important information also. Never, ever talk to the police without an attorney present. And seriously, boys, lawyers needed lawyers for talking to other lawyers. Every (laughs) time they're (laughs) dropping information, it's like, oh, you did that? Well, that's illegal, sir. God, I love that whole (laughs) posse that Roy has, Mm -hmm. including the FBI guy who wants to join the posse. And then there's that one scene where they just leave him behind. I love Uh, that one. We'll call you. (laughs) Yeah. Jason, Larry, and Thomas, and Mr. Fultrick. And again, my... My God, what a character actor Palooza they got for all four of them. I mean, William yes. Sanderson, Bradley Whitford, Anthony Held, J.T. Walsh. It's like, these are some of the great character <laughs> actors. Yep. And Bradley Whitford before he became a major actor in his own right. Nice. I like the cast in this movie. Yeah, it is a good cast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, Anthony Edwards, the same year that E.R. debuted with him as Reggie's assistant. Yeah. Yeah, was his character ever named? I have a question, though. Mm-hmm. Why is he there? That's all I want to know. Like, he literally does nothing except follow her around looking worried sometimes. (laughs) Boyfriend, clearly yeah. he's the reason that Reggie and Roy never get the past, you know, angry tension. Clearly. Well, I don't know. She fixed his tie for him, so. Mm, mm-hmm. Could yeah. be something going on in the future. Yeah. <laughs> he's the assistant. He's her yeah. Joe Friday. He's the secretary. He, he's her girl, girl Friday, Friday, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure this was, you know, like you said, it's like right at the same time as ER, so we hadn't gotten big yet. But it's like, this character is completely unnecessary. Mm. Well, also, you know, she steals his credit card and car and everything with permission. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was a fun presence. I like the way he played the character. Again, I always like how Joel will build little roles into you guys' characters. Mm-hmm. Like, again, Kimberly Scott as Doreen is a tiny character, but it's still kind of memorable in the way they play her. Yeah. yeah. There's two members of that whole posse around Roy that never speak, but they're distinctive because... Because they're character actors that you've seen are all over the place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I didn't have a problem with Anthony Edwards. You know, in the book, there was this whole backstory where they actually met through her drug treatment program because he was an addict himself. Okay. Ooh, okay. When she cleaned up and went through law school, he was just getting out and she was his sponsor and also gave him a job. Okay. And so he's just a dedicated assistant. It seems like he's just always fretting in the background. <laughs> he's her bracket. I know she takes his car, but you know. <laughs> In the book, she was also a little older, and it was always kind of played out that she has a lot of these son figures in her life that are like like Mark. She has a lot Mm -hmm. of clients who are children. And even him, he was a young man who she met in treatment program. She likes to watch out for him. Gotcha. She sees the good in in a lot of people and tries to bring it up to the surface. Mm. Susan Sarandon was herself 48, so she was not much younger than the character in the book. But the character in the book was a little more matronly, you know, very dowdy, short gray hair, glasses, all stuff. Mm. He was supposed to tie in to that aspect of her. Okay. But again, like Akiva Goldsman interprets that as he's the assistant. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's what he does and nothing else. There were entire plot threads about him like hiding in his closet for 12 hours while she's on the run <laughs> so he doesn't have to answer the door because he thinks the FBI are going to come in and arrest him. Wow. There were a lot of threads in the okay. book that just never mm-hmm. made it into the movie. And Thank God. It's one of those ones that I think you could adapt as like a great six, seven hour miniseries. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They did make it a TV show, yeah. but not quite in the same way. God, I wasn't able to find any clips of that show online at all. Mm. Really? Huh. I think someone's got a legal lock on it. Maybe so. Laws. She's going to have a different case each week, and it was all going to be about her and Full Trig. Nice. Ish. <laughs> They're what? always against each other. Mm. Okay. On every case. <laughs> <laughs> That seems contrived and yet also necessary, I suppose. To be fair, I want to see John Hurd's full trick. Mm-hmm. So, hey, full trick, Tommy Lee Jones, who got an Oscar nomination for this movie. He did. Really? He's good. Yeah. Supporting actor? Yep. That okay. would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Like, he definitely wasn't around enough to be a lead. <laughs> yeah. 
he's good in it, you know, inaccurate accent aside. Mm. <laughs> but no, like, I mean, he's Tommy Lee Jones. He's solid in everything he does, really. Since when are politicians actually from the places that they represent? It depends. I guess you usually have to at least have a house there. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be fair, I think he plays the role really well. Mm. The character is fun and flamboyant, again, with the posse following him around. But there's not much there. He's just the opposition. Right. He's just the opposing figure. Mm -hmm. To be fair, what I like about the end with especially him and Reggie is they're not enemies. He's not evil. He's not a villain. Right. This experience actually gave him a lot of respect for each other, but they're still antagonists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Opposed without necessarily being enemies. Yeah. yeah. Both working towards a mutual goal of ensuring that justice is done. Just, you know, she's working real hard to use the law and he's working to circumvent it. I think she should have gotten nominated, though, too. She, yeah. yeah. She actually did win a number of acting awards, like the Actors Guild Awards and People's Choice Award and all that stuff, but she wasn't even nominated for Oscar. That seems absurd. And Tommy Lee Jones wasn't nominated for anything else but the Oscar. Okay. Okay. Mm. Mm. I know. It's frustrating. Mm. <laughs> and again, that a lot of the marketing played it on the interplay between those two. And again, they're really only in like three scenes. I'm going to say, did they have like every scene that they're in in the commercials? Because Pretty much. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, they have the initial interview, they have the courtroom appearance, and then they have the ending. Yeah. When the diner scene, which is leading into the end. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah. segue from the boathouse just suddenly diner. That felt very sudden. Yeah. Time to wrap up the film. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are making me recommend it less. Yes. <laughs> success. I do like the whole scene in the courtroom with Ozzie Davis as the judge. Mm -hmm. And that was good. He's great. Him versus Foltrig's gang was great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's all just like, you come into my house. Yeah. And you throw this at me. No, sit yeah. down. Your butt belongs in that seat. Nowhere else. <laughs> mm -hmm. I still enjoy this, but I still enjoy seeing how a lot of these scenes are executed individually. But, you know, as together, mm -hmm. it's a weak story. Yeah. Yeah. It's not as weak as like dying young. No. No, that one was kind of painful at points. Yeah. Should I see it? I haven't seen it. Don't see it. No. Okay. Don't recommend. Got it. Anything else, Angie, that leaves to mind that you want to bring up about this movie? Just a couple other little bit parts. Dan Castellaneta mm. as the uh, reporter oh, was yeah. kind of entertaining and silly. Definitely much more smaller, but Amy Hathaway as the nurse. Mm. I used to watch My Two Dads. I was like, yeah. oh, I yes. remember her. That was kind of a nice little moment. I've never seen My Two Dads. Oh, it's good. Okay. Oh, I love that show so much. Show. Loved it. And then it was interesting with the actor that cast as the cop, Will Patton. Great character yeah. actor. But what was interesting was there were a bunch of cops who appeared throughout the story, and they mm. just decided, let's make them all the same cop. Sergeant Harding. He was just such a jerk. Yeah. He was. He really was. I have three oh. pages of notes before his name comes up. Sergeant Harding. Before that, he's bad cop. He's just like one other <laughs> bad cop. What a jerk. One of five stars. Would not recommend. Why are you being so mean to this kid? I would rather there were some nuance to it that he was worried about the kid. Yeah. Knew he was into something and just really wanted to find out what. Right. The true antagonist of the film. <laughs> <laughs> Also, I suppose the guy with the knife, sure. <laughs> and then I love that they add a scene in the courtroom where, for some reason, they're just sitting in the back of the courtroom just yeah. so Ozzie Davis can dismiss him and the reporter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can dismiss them from the story by saying, you have no place here anymore, and you, reporter, if you write one more word about this, I am. Because in the book, they actually do bring the reporter into the courtroom and actually arrest him. Oh, wow. Nice. Because he's the one who bribes the bailiff for information. <gasps> oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was a big twist where they have the mob now bribing the bailout. Yeah. Mm. And then they slam his ass in jail. Dismissed from the story. <laughs> oh, my God. And then the Ozzie Davis judge is like throughout so much of the book because there's like four courtroom scenes. Oh, wow. Where okay. it's like the kid refuses to testify. We're bringing you back tomorrow. Kid refuses to testify. We're bringing you back tomorrow. In a John Grisham film? And then the kid refuses to testify <laughs> and, and the judge is like, well, I'm going to be taking a fishing trip with my boys. So we'll see you on Monday. <laughs> That's a judge, all right. <laughs> oh, and they have whole bits where it's like the judge has a full schedule. Well, okay, I'll work this in on my lunch break. Mm. And him and Reggie go way back. The whole thing is he goes on a fishing trip right when Mark breaks out of jail. So no one mm. can find the judge. <laughs> I do like that scene just between Reggie and Judge Harry. Yeah. Yes. There's so much warmth and depth right there. Mm -hmm. And that adds so much context to the court scene later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It actually makes me most curious about the TV series is they actually brought him back. And he's in like 13 or really? 20 some episodes. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. So I'd just be curious to see how they develop that. 13 episodes. They can't be found anywhere. What it sounds like with the TV series is it's basically Reggie loved the TV series. Good. 
it. They don't have the Mark's Way plot. They actually just leave that for the movie. And they named it The Client. Yes. When it's about the attorney. <laughs> okay. But she has a client every episode, so... Oh, just, just throw an S on the end. The Client's... <laughs> Oh, you could just call this TV series Ms. Love. And at the end of the opening credit sequence, it's like title sequence, Ms. Love. Cut to her, like, turn and look it over her shoulder. I said, call me Reggie. <laughs> Very 90s. Yes. You know, if the show had come out probably about five years later, it might still be on the air. <laughs> they love court dramas so much. It did. It was called Allie McBeal. Right, exactly. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> court so, procedurals. So many. <laughs> So, Wes, anything else you can think of you want to bring up? Let's see. I got the super paranoid neighbors who live right next to the mob. <laughs> Mark and Ricky's mom doesn't even get a name until halfway through the movie, Diane. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The way that her boss just abruptly fired her. Because I have enough time in HR that that's just rung so many bells right there. Well, but remember, it's a sweatshop. Yeah. yeah. So he's probably paying her under the table anyway. Yeah. Even my job, as long as you have like medical notes, yeah. you can get a few weeks before we'll let you go. Sure. <laughs> I hate the paparazzi. But this guy, he's not actually paparazzi. Apparently he's like front page newspaper. Okay, sure. Yeah. I'll buy that. I do like the <laughs> moment where like Mark is, I don't need you anymore. And he walks down the street and all the press sees him and starts running towards him. So he runs back into her car. Well, time's running back. Mm -hmm. Reggie's you'll be just like them moment. So cliche. Oh, hey, Weston. Yeah. Have you ever seen an Eskimo piss? <laughs> That is the most memorable thing from this movie, right there. That was so bad and yet so authentic. Click, 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 click. Yeah, uh, yeah. What about an 11-year-old schooling someone much older than him on Led Zeppelin? Oh, or yeah. To... Oh, the whole Led Zeppelin, that came out of nowhere. Like, oh my God. The no true Scotsman moment. That was not in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that whole you're not a true fan unless you can answer my questions thing. Uh <laughs> Yeah. What does a girl know about Led Zeppelin? Like, they could have picked Guns N' Roses or somebody more modern, at least. It was the 90s. Someone who was actually yeah. of the era in which this band existed. Mm -hmm. Right. How dare you think you know more than me, lady? Exactly. Oh, Maybe man. that's supposed to be the joke, but man. So, Angie, let me tell you more about X-Men. <laughs> 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 yeah, you go ahead. <laughs> in the opening in Barry's introduction, when the FBI is going after him with a camera and, you know, you got the time and the recording on there, and it's just this mini VHS camera. I love that. <laughs> yeah, they're following him with a literal video camera. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was funny. Mm -mm. But yeah, I think that's everything in the notes. I mean, the whole mob stuff, almost all of those scenes were added. Okay. Because, I mean, the mob played a part in the book. Mm -hmm. But not that strong. They rewrote it, a lot of it. And a lot of it was, again, the hitmen planning wires, surveilling everyone. Both the mob and the FBI are trying to wire Reggie and Mark. Mm -hmm. And they keep, like, running into each other. <laughs> hey, there's already a wire in here. Somebody's listening to us put this. Well, you know, let's take theirs out and put ours in. Yeah, okay, we'll do that. And then I love the plot <laughs> twist of the FBI through a wiretap, learn that the mob is going to wiretap someone. Mm. So they use a wiretap to listen in for when that guy is going to plant the wiretap and bust it. Mm -hmm. That's what happened to Elvis Pesley guy. Good times. Yeah. The score. I like the score. I like the guitars. <laughs> Was it right? Did nice atmosphere score. Not like super memorable, but yeah, it's better than mm. music. I mean, and I think the film is crisply made. It's nicely shot. Yeah. Everything looks nice. It, it, it's more buttoned down than a lot of Joel's stuff. Mm -hmm. Not as, quite as flamboyant, with the exception of that bit where he's chased him to the hospital. Right. But I mean, that makes sense yeah. for the plot, you know. I like some of the editing is solid. Like Diane and Reggie are walking through the hospital mm -hmm. talking about stuff. I liked that scene. But other scenes where they do a real quick shot in the beginning when they're smoking and they drop the cigarettes in the dirt. And then there's this real close-up of the dirt with the mm -hmm. two cigarettes. It's like, mm -hmm. ah, yes, that's Chekhov's cigarette right there. <laughs> it's kind of blatant, but it's all right. That's, again, Akiva Goldsman knows all the tricks. Akiva Goldsman is also one of those writers who will have someone say a line in the opening of an early scene in the movie, and then near the end of the movie, someone else will say that line back to them to show they've learned that lesson. That did happen. <laughs> 
when Mark and Rami are in the car. Yeah. And they're doing that thing. And he's like, you're not going to shoot me. You should shoot me. Shoot me something. Whatever they're saying right there. The ironic echo. Later on, when Barry's like, you should have let him shoot me. All that jazz. Mm -hmm. That callback. Yeah. Angie, what did you think about that whole opening scene? It felt like a whole lot. Like, I guess it needs to be because it's kind of what the whole movie is about is what happened then. But Mm -hmm. it was just like, could this guy just kill himself already? Like, this is taking (laughs) Mm -hmm. so long. Mm -hmm. I remember reading the book and it's like, that's a crackling good intro where it's just these two brothers just wandering out. The older brother trying to teach the younger brother how to smoke for the first time. It was was awful, but it was, again, very authentically done. Mm -hmm. And then they see this car pull up and the guy putting in the hose and they realize what it is in the whole let's sneak up pull out the hose and then gets dragged into the car and then it goes on because mark pulls out the hose twice Mm -hmm. in the book it's about four times but it's the second time he's caught Mm -hmm. and it's like oh my god like okay and like back and forth with the gun and oh and then ricky pulls the hose out twice right in the book too so they cut it down. Oh, God. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, he didn't even make it once in the movie. Yeah. yeah. Watching this again as a dad, that was pretty heavy right there when Ricky's mm-hmm. just like super traumatized. Also later when Reggie is in her garage and looking at baseball glove and mm-hmm. a little art and ah, that shoe. I still have Finn's shoes, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that really hit home for me. Because, you know, in the book, it's like he's looking right at them across the field, eye to mm-hmm. eye, as he then puts the gun to his head and shoots it. So they mm-hmm. both see it. That would do it. Okay. And then there's a really sad scene where it's like as they're running home, he notices that Ricky is starting to run more limply and then just starts making a moaning sound. And then, like, mm-hmm. literally when they get home, he just kind of slumps on the floor and then won't move anymore. Mm-hmm. He's gradually shutting down. And that is the end of Ricky's character. And here, yeah he just like cut too and in the book yeah. after a couple of days he was starting to come out of it they were starting to gradually get him to say words and stuff mm-hmm. and then the police show up to arrest mark and then he goes right back in mm-hmm. i mean he wasn't as yeah. fully catatonic in the book it was more just huddling up and just not responding yeah. okay obligatory ptsd is no joke folks make sure that you reach out if you need help yeah one final note, this is the last of five films edited by Robert Brown, because you mentioned the editing. Oh, okay. Because he did, again, Flatliners, Lost Boys, Cousins, Dying Young. It'll be interesting to see what Joel's going to be like, because there's been such striking editing in a few of those movies. Mm-hmm. Interesting to see what Joel's like without that. Yeah. And the costume designer for this movie is also going to be the head costume designer of the two Batman movies. <gasps> that's a shift. Yeah, that's quite a shift. Wow. <laughs> Speaking of Joel, I love all the prison graffiti. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, that was a weird thing where in the book it's like, yeah, here's your cell. Here it's like, here's your entire ward. (laughs) Find a bed. I loved the pizza prank. Yeah. Just got to throw that out. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Kind of random, but sure, why not? I do like the book even went further. Like he called one pizza joint, ordered 10 pizzas. He called another pizza joint, ordered 10 pizzas. Called a Chinese place. I think he racks up like $560. But you can't (laughs) order pizzas from a Chinese place. (laughs) No, but you order delivery Chinese food. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, okay. From a pizza place. (laughs) No, this is the only revenge, the only kind of resolution, the only way that Officer Bad Cop, Sergeant Harding, gets any of what's coming to him. And even then, it's to his lieutenant who's sitting behind him. Yeah. yeah. It's the one guy who we only see in one scene. Yeah. It should have been the regular cop, yeah. Yeah, yeah it should have. If you're going to smush him with everybody, just smush him with that guy, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he got pizza out of it, so I hope he was a <laughs> Though you're making me think, there's got to be someone out there who's made Chinese food pizza. Believe it or not, there's a place in Des Moines called Fong's Pizza. They make the best Crab Rangoon pizza (gasps) because nobody else makes Crab Rangoon pizza, but also because it's actually good. I want to try that. Is it actual crab or imitation crab? Because I'm allergic to the imitation. I'm going to say yes. (sighs) I have no idea. I would have to call and ask. But no, their Kung Pao chicken pizza, Mm. fantastic. This is amazing. Yeah. I know that the owner used to work at the place that I worked at for 12 years. She was just like, hey, there's a Chinese place. Hmm, I don't know anything about Chinese food. Let's make pizza. Okay. (laughs) And it works. That's awesome. I think we've pretty much covered the majority of the film. Wes, any final thoughts? Um... <laughs> Angie. Like I said, it's an okay movie. It's not awful. It's not great. It's got some good performances. It's got a wide cast. I don't know. It's, yeah. It's just kind of there. It's what it is. Yeah. It's mid 90s. Yeah. A wide cast. <laughs> yes. I enjoy the film enough 
I still get enough out of it that I enjoy it. I like the cast. I think it is crisply directed. The story has enough hooks and enough good scenes in it that keeps me invested. But yeah, it doesn't all come together. The third act is a bit out of nowhere. Mm. But again, I still think it's played well. I still think it's entertaining enough that it's worth a watch. It's not an edge-of-your-seat thriller. It's not an intellectually compelling legal drama. It's not the deepest, richest of character dramas. It's just a nice movie. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get to the book eventually. I feel like the book would probably be a little bit stronger in building some of those things. And again, it's not an unfaithful adaptation of the book. It's just the book had so many peripheral things that understandably were all shaved down and more streamlined. Mm -hmm. But it it was a very well-written book. I really enjoyed it. It was a really enjoyable book. But again, it's I think people think of you know, John Grisham and his ilk and they think of thrillers. Right. And again, the book is not really a thriller. It's a drama mm-hmm. and almost slightly a satire at times. The movie tried to add thriller elements that I don't think worked. And I think the drama stuff doesn't fully come together. But it's still enjoyable and well-made enough that, yeah, I do recommend it. And thankfully, they rewrote most of Akiva Goldsmith's dialogue. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> And then, give me one sec here, I'm just checking the... God, how did this movie cost $45 million to make in 1994? Seriously? Well, Wikipedia says citation needed, so... Okay. Yeah, obviously. I mean, were they just paying Tommy Lee Jones that much? Because this is right after The Fugitive. (laughs) Maybe. Mm. Could be it. Yeah, I mean, they did have enough big names. Well, some of those names when they were small before they get big, but... yeah. Yeah. Clearly, it was the boathouse. <laughs> but this was allegedly 45. I'm going to guess closer to 20. That sounds about right for this period. It's a pretty small, tight movie. I don't see the cast demanding like huge. Susan Sarandon needed $3 million to be in this movie. <laughs> I don't see that. Yeah. This movie came out on July 22nd, 1994. Also opened that week, already in their runs, were Forrest Gump, (laughs) True Lies, The Lion King, Angels in the Outfield, and Speed. That is a hard lineup to go up against. And the Flintstones. (laughs) But I mean, yeah, that's like most of your top 10 there to drop in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. And it was opening against Lassie, because remember, they made a (laughs) film adaptation of Lassie in the 90s. Yeah. And North, the Elijah Wood travesty. Mm. Both of which opened at seven and eight. The client opened at number two. Hmm, decent. Behind Forrest Gump, which was in its third week. Of course. Okay. Because that was a monster powerhouse of a movie. Yeah. Sure. In its second week of release, the client dropped to number four, Blow True Lies, because that was when The Mask came out. Oh, boy. At number one. That's rough. Beat out by The Mask. <laughs> and that probably led to Jim Carrey and Ben. <laughs> well. Just think about that. Tying it all together. <laughs> The Little Rascals movie opened at number four. Wow. That was a busy three weeks. One of my favorite movies, Airheads, opened at number 10. Mm. And opening at number one was Clear and Present Danger. Okay. Yeah. The other big author that was being adapted at the time. Oh, Tom Clancy. (laughs) Yeah, it's like the 90s were like best-selling author decade. It was Tom Mm -hmm. Clancy, John Grisham, Michael Crichton. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bit of Stephen King in there. Stephen King still had a ton in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dean Koontz had a few, but he never really caught on that big in the movie world. Mostly because he was an asshole and didn't like the movies. (laughs) I hear that hurts. Yeah. In its fourth week of release, the client dropped to number eight. Clear and Present Danger remained in number one. Forrest Gump was still number two. Mm. And then opening at number six is Polly Shore's In the Army Now. Oh, boy. I saw that. Number six, really? Yeah, saw opened that. at number wow. six below True Lies, The Little Rascals, The Mask, Forrest Gump, and Clear and Present Danger. Where it belongs. Wow. It's where it deserves to be. Well, I'm just surprised it even got that high. It'll probably oh, yeah. drop off the next week. <laughs> One hopes. Well, yeah, The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, opened at number 14. Mm. Okay. So let's see where we are in week five. The client is now holding. It's still at number nine, so it's like very slowly. Anyway, we're still in the top ten. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In the Army now has already dropped below it. Yep, Good. yep, yep. <laughs> yeah. So opening in number 11 is Blank Man. Oh, man. Oh, okay. So guess what? Clear and Present Danger has dropped to number two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, number one is Forrest Gump. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had a feeling that might happen. That one never died. Unpossible. No. That was a phenomenon. And opening at number five is the teen drama Andre. I don't think I remember that one. Vaguely? At number four, Color of Night. I don't remember that one. Color of Night sounds vaguely familiar. I feel like I should know that one. In its sixth week of release, The Client is now at number 10. Mm-hmm. Opening at number 13 is John Candy's last film, Wagons East. Mm-hmm. Opening at number 8 is Daniel Stern in Camp Nowhere. Okay. 
And opening at number one is Natural Born Killers. Mm. Okay. God, the top four there. Natural Born Killers, Forrest Gump, Clear and Present Danger, and The Mask. <laughs> nice wide variety yeah. of films for the time. <laughs> that's a spread, yeah. That's... We're hanging in there. In its seventh week, the client is still at number 10. Mm. It's holding. Yeah. And Natural Born Killers has dropped to number two. At number one is Forrest Gump. <laughs> of course. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> And Clear and Present Danger and The Mask are still right behind. So that was, mm. yeah. Is a film called Milk Money open at number five? I don't know that one. Oh, it sounds vaguely familiar. God, and I love like True Lies and The Lion King are still in the top ten, too. Good. Man, that was a summer for films that just held. True Lies yeah. was solid. Oh, True Lies was good. Mm-hmm. In its eighth week, The Client is still at number 10. Really? It's still holding. It's still Forrest Gump, Natural Born Killers, Clear and Present Danger, and at number four, <laughs> Trial by Jury? Okay. I don't know that one. I was hoping you were going to say Trial by Combat. <laughs> okay, and then we'll drop off here because it's out of the top 10. In its ninth week, The Client is at number 12. Opening at number one, finally bumping Forrest Gump back out of that is Time Cop. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, great. <laughs> so your top five were Milk Money, Natural Born Killers, Clear and Present Danger, Forrest Gump, and Time Cop. <laughs> Jean-Claude Van Damme, right? Mm-hmm. What is Milk Money? Milk Money starring Melanie Griffith and Ed Harris? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. One of them has kids, I think. Ed Harris. If vaguely, you remember that. So again, The Client, it didn't open at number one. It didn't stay in the top five for very long, but it held in the top ten for nine weeks. Mm-hmm. So that's over two months, yeah. Yeah, it's a decent showing. That's right. Against a budget that was likely not $45 million, <laughs> it pulled in $97 million at the box office and 117 worldwide. That's not bad. So yeah, not a huge hit, but again, it's respectable. Mm-hmm. It's amazing that it had legs given what else was in the theaters at the time. Yeah. Because <laughs> again, when you have like True Lies, Forrest Gump, Natural Born Killers, Clear present danger in the top 10 for months in milk mm-hmm. lion king <laughs> and they're just like swatting away flex like in the army now and stuff like that mm-hmm. it's respectable that it stood alongside all that and again it was a well-regarded movie mostly for the cast and the actors it was popular enough that again the tv series came out one year later in 1995 mm-hmm any thoughts on the legacy that is the client? I think I can see why he's got a couple more Grisham adaptations to go. I think it was definitely a solid enough effort at the box office that they would trust him with this again. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to get to Time to Kill and then we won't do a full episode on it, but we will bring up Runaway Jury again, which he was going to direct. Okay. Which same producer too, by the way. Mm-hmm. Weston, any, any final thoughts in general on that legacy of the client and the John Grisham era in general? And Nothing specific. They all just kind of okay. put together a little bit. I mean, it's there. Yeah. It is what it is. It is interesting that this does get lumped in with a lot of the legal thrillers of the period when there's not really much mm-hmm. legalese in it. They have a court scene that is all you need. I mean, it's called The Client, yeah, so yeah. it's natural to be associated. <laughs> Whereas I know stuff like A Time to Kill and The Rainmaker and stuff were like in the courtroom or like runaway jury mm-hmm. in the jury's room and all that stuff. Even like A Few Good Men, even though that's military, it's still total. Yeah. yeah. But again, that this isn't the first John Grisham one that got adapted. I mean, the first mm-hmm. one that got adapted was The Pelican Brief, which is a thriller. Mm-hmm. Right. And then The Firm, which is, again, a thriller and a legal drama, very firm. Like, if I yeah. was going to categorize this movie, it's definitely feels like a quasi courtroom drama because it does spend some time in there. But it tries to branch out into the whole thriller with like the mafia and the threats and the action sequences that it doesn't quite fit in there. It wants to, yeah. but it doesn't belong mm-hmm. there. And that's where I think, again, the book wasn't trying to be a thriller. And the yeah. movie's trying to kind of ease that book into being more of a thriller than it was. Yeah. I'm glad they'd still limit that. The whole scene with him in their elevator mm-hmm. with the guy throwing him, that is from the book. Them having their trailer burned down is from the book. But being chased, the guy constantly, you know, showing up in his life, trying to lure him into a truck and all that stuff. Hey, kid, want some Pez? And again, the whole climax of the boathouse. Yeah. I do love the paranoid neighbors running out with a shotgun and then suddenly bullets are flying out. And it's like, oh, no, they're shooting back. <laughs> like, what did you think was going to happen? Right. I thought I was going to scare them off with my shotgun. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, anyways, thank you, Weston, for joining us again. It's been a pleasure yes, recording you. with you after all these years. It is an absolute pleasure to be with you. So good night, Angie. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, 
please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot dot com. Schumacast can also be found on Stitcher. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Noel, I love remakes. Don't see the remake. Got it. All right. <laughs> I defend remakes as an art form. <laughs> of course. It does not mean I support every remake. Nah. Well, you would support them as they're coming out. Once they're released, <laughs> it's a different story. That's why I say I support <laughs> in concept doing a remake of a thing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It should be yeah. made and then should be eviscerated in reviews. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. You still have to live up to that potential that you are now stepping into. There we are. Yeah. I look at remakes as a challenge. I challenge you. Make this and make it interesting. That is a great way to phrase it. I love it. I think that's the thing that nobody else ever picked up on for years is I'm saying that as a challenge. Mm -hmm. This is open potential. Meet it. And I love that about you. Coming from you and your beard, that means a lot. <laughs> the beard flows. God, I miss recording with you. <laughs> <laughs> Angie, you're pretty good, too. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs>